Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Fred Burton. He's the author of many books, most recently Beirut Rules, The Murder of a CIA Station Chief and Hezbollah's War Against America. Fred was a police officer in Montgomery County and then an agent in the Secret Service. And from 1985 to 1999, he was a special agent with the U.S. Diplomatic Security Service and eventually became the deputy chief of the DSS Counterterrorism Division, where he investigated Al-Qaeda New York City bombing plots in the years before 9-11, and he was involved in the arrest of Ramzi Youssef, the mastermind of the first World Trade Center bombing in 1993. You'll hear his thoughts about Iran, you'll hear his thoughts about Hezbollah, you'll hear his thoughts about terrorism, and you'll hear that he knows what he's talking about. Now, I want to take a second to remind you of our support of our favorite cause, Save the Brave. They're a certified 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to helping veterans cope with post-traumatic stress. You can read all about them at savethebrave.org and donate a few bucks to help them help some veterans who could use a hand. Now, Pete and I both support Save the Brave with our time and with recurring contributions right out of our PayPal accounts. Scott Husing supports them, too, with his generosity and by serving on their board. Now, they do great work in our communities that benefit firsthand from their results, so we urge you to support them, too. And while we're at it, we also appreciate your support of the Break It Down show. It helps if you rate and review our show Buy yourself a t-shirt and a hoodie and drop us a line to let us know what you're thinking and what makes you listen in. Seeing your comments and your shares helps new listeners find us and we appreciate you doing that. Joining Pete on today's episode is co-host, our friend, Dr. Jason Piccolo. He too is a former special agent and supervisor with the Department of Homeland Security. He patrolled trafficking corridors as a Border Patrol agent near the San Diego, Mexico border and has gone on to write a few books himself. We think you're really going to love this episode. Here is our guest today, Fred Burton. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copa. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Fred Burton, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. Boy, we are in luck today. I've also got Jason Piccolo co-hosting. He uh, He's the one that connected me to Fred. And, and I always like to have Jason come on because we, uh, we're all ground truth guys. And Fred's experience that you're about to learn about it, but is, is remarkable. This is a spy versus spy episode. So we're going to talk about intelligence and, and what it means to actually do the job. Not, not like, hey, there's a mole at the top of the CIA, like that bullshit. Like actually people who actually do these things. Fred's written books on, well, the Middle East in general, but in particular Benghazi. Which obviously, look, you've been beat up on this thing the last few uh, last few days, talking about the General Soleimani, uh, him getting killed, but also, you know, the parallels between Benghazi and the Baghdad uh, embassy uh, attacks. What are your? Or I guess technically in Benghazi was a consulate, but either way, um, what are your thoughts on President Trump and his? elevation of what we've done i mean look soleimani's packet has been on three president's desks they all picked something this is what i was saying in my little video they all picked something they didn't pick him you know bush and obama didn't pick him but president trump did what are your overall thoughts in terms as an intel guy what are your thoughts well first i have no love loss for general soleimani just predicated upon all the carnage that uh, he had created and and the iranians uh, have perpetrated since uh, 1983. Uh, you know, I'm a product of that environment. Uh, my entire career was shaped by the U.S. Embassy bombings in Beirut twice in 1983 and 84, and the U.S. Embassy bombing in Kuwait in 84, and then the subsequent hijackings and hostage takings carried out by uh, this foreign policy tool of Iran known as Hezbollah. So, uh, I think uh, that, um, you know, the one thing that Jason and I and all of us are, are uh, we don't have visibility in, into at the moment is the exact intelligence which indicated why this had to occur at this moment in time. 
Having said that, as a product of the intelligence community, I, I do believe that that was probably fairly good information, which caused uh, to move the needle. And then there was a window of opportunity to take advantage of uh, killing Soleimani. Uh, and I think sometimes at the end of the day, it is that simple. Yeah, and I guess the, the misconception is that the president said, I want to kill someone. And then someone said, how about the top general in Iran? But, you know, I think all three of us know that's that's just not how that works. You, you don't create lethal targeting packages out of thin air. Like you said, there's got to be some intel. And, and it doesn't just you don't just put your career in line and throw something up three levels above your level to the president's desk. It just doesn't it doesn't work like that, at least not from my experience. Uh, nor from mine either. I mean, uh, you know, at times uh, you do get lucky. I, I was in my past fortunate enough to be involved with uh, the capture of Ramsey Yosef, the mastermind of the first World Trade Center bombing. And, you know, quite frankly, we got lucky uh, with a uh, source, a, a, a walk in source that provided us very good information. And, and we had a window of opportunity to take advantage of. And, and I think at times it, it does boil down to that. Yeah, he, that's a really good point, is a walk-in source, human. I think Pete and I always talk about how vital human is. And I think you and I talked about it on, on my show as well. Is it, you need human intelligence. And just like Soleimani, if they say must have had a source, they say, hey, you know what, this is a good one. He's packaged right. He's got a, a good crew with him right now. Let's take the shot, you know? I agree with you 100%, Jason. I think once uh... – the dust settles from uh, the General Soleimani killing that we'll find that uh, there was uh, at least one good human source involved in this, uh, combined with um, amazing technology that, that our U.S. Uh, intelligence community possesses today. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it still boils down to having that human intelligence. I, when I talk or I teach on this topic, you know, there's always, to me, two things that you look at from a lessons learned perspective or every terrorist attack I've ever investigated, uh, you, you boil it down to two things. One, they are successful because there's a lack of human intelligence to neutralize that plot, or there's a failure of tactical analysis. And if you have both, then you usually have some sort of catastrophic disaster, whether that be the bombing of an embassy or the assassination of a government official. Well, Fred, you know, you've been investigating terrorism since basically since you were a kid. I mean, if you if you look at your first book, Chasing Shadows, not first book, but if you look at Chasing Shadows, you know, you've been engulfed in terrorism basically your whole life. And there's been that whole common factor. You could have all the technology in the world, but unless you're out there talking to people and really digging into the puzzle of uh, tracking terrorists, i.e. through human sources and everything else, nothing's going to get done. I always tell people in the law enforcement world, you can never put someone behind jail, behind bars, if, if you're sitting behind a keyboard. You <laughs> eventually have to talk to someone. Yeah, very well said. I, I agree with you 100% along those lines. Hey, I wanted to ask you a little bit too about this whole situation because as collectors, and all three of us have intel backgrounds, uh, Everybody's worried about the retribution. And I think I'm going to assume that all three of us are saying, hey, look, there's not going to be a state on state war here, at least not anytime soon. But Iran is going to continue to operate. They're not just going to box up shop. That was never the case. That was also the case if General Soleimani was still alive. They would still continue to operate and, and push and look for advantage. Like So so we're talking about a, a single activity here that hopefully for us now takes those great capabilities you're talking about and as iran tries to scramble to figure out what's next we got our big old ears open we got our human network being developed and maintained and improved i look at this as being yes there will be some kind of continued action from iran but the more they're going to talk about what they're going to do hey the better chance we got of getting lucky what are your thoughts on that well i agree with you 100 percent. i think that uh we are in the uh, best position uh, possible from a five eyes collective uh, uh, intelligence collection umbrella. Uh, I think that our footprint uh, throughout the Persian Gulf and the Middle East uh, predicated upon what we've been doing uh, in our endless wars in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, for uh, a good number of years now. 
and our robust uh, intelligence collection technology tools that have been developed since 9-11. Therefore, uh, if it's some sort of organized plot by a nation state actor such as Iran, uh, I think we're going to pick up on it. Now, of course, um, my fear is the asymmetric use of, of uh, proxies such as Hezbollah. And, uh, and I might, you know, granted, uh, you know, I've been too close to this flagpole for, for many, many years. I, I've seen the damage they've been able to do. But the one thing that frightens me when you're talking about a, a group like Hezbollah is that they have consistently surprised us uh, in the target sets and the locations that they've chosen. And that's the one thing that would worry me. Uh, then again, I don't have visibility into, you know, the threat streams from Hezbollah anymore and, and so forth. And, and I have faith and confidence in the CIA and the NSA and, and partners such as the Israeli Mossad to be able to help. One of the narratives that we hear a lot of times, too, from folks who aren't intel people. Oh, and by the way, just real quick, tell us what Five Eyes means, and then I'm going to go into my question. Five Eyes is our partnership that we have uh, that has been around uh, since predominantly World War II between uh, the United States, uh, the UK, Canada, New Zealand. And it's a shared partnership uh, amongst our nation states when it comes to uh, national security issues that may affect any of us. It's predominantly, uh, from a historical perspective, used to, to look at nation-state actors or, or threats that might affect uh, the West. Uh, and uh, so those, those resources are leveraged across the entire globe, literally, uh, so we can cover it in, in an umbrella-like atmosphere. So, which feeds... Obviously, I know what five eyes are, but I wanted to get that set up so the audience could follow this part of it. So a few weeks ago, when we were upset because we were abandoning our allies in the Kurds, even though the Kurds are not technically an ally, they're a friend, taking on and pushing back with Iran is something that we all do combined as a alliance. I mean, this is, you know, we need to take this action. We're going to share this intel. We're all going to work on this problem together of trying to rein in Hezbollah uh, El Shabaab, whoever the terrorist organization is, and also look at how Iran or whoever the state player is, is funding them. So this is this actually is an action that supports our alliance. At least I'm going to say that from my point of view. Do you do you agree with that? Or would you say something different? No, I, I view this uh, in the same kind of concept uh, as Interpol, meaning if, if you look at this from on a practical level, I can remember many, many years ago working on a hijacking case where the plane landed in Tehran and an American uh, was murdered and the body was thrown out on the tarmac in Tehran. And we were not supposed to have any kind of diplomatic relations with Iran, obviously, after the 79 embassy takeover. I reached out through Interpol and believe it or not, the Iranians uh, are a at that time uh, had an active presence in Interpol and a police agency cooperated with that police agency, even though we may be enemies when it came on the diplomatic front and so forth. Uh, if memory serves me right, I got a little bit of trouble for that at the time, but I got the information that I needed. Uh, and I think that's how Five Eyes works uh, when you're looking at this kind of environment. You might have all the rhetoric in the world and nation states saying, Big bad USA, why did you do this? But behind the scenes, as Jason well knows, and you know, uh, agents do their job, analysts do their job, cops do their job. And if you get a request from another government to help you on a counterterrorism case or whatever they, the lead might be, you work the lead. That's how the system works. Yeah, I wanted to shift focus a little bit. You know, you, you're the one book I just read from you, Chasing Shadows. I'm going to put this out there for everybody to buy it because you need to. And nowadays, Chasing Shadows, a special agent's lifelong hunt to bring a Cold War assassin to justice. And a big thing about that is you're tracking a terrorist suspect from the 1970s, essentially, a whole network. And a lot of that dealt with sleeper cells. Now, uh, the first thing people said as soon as we killed Suleimani was, Hey, or Suleiman, hey, you know what? They have to have sleeper cells. They're going to attack us at any moment. But one point that you brought up in the book is they're well-planned and well-rehearsed before they do anything. 
What are your thoughts on the sleeper cell uh, situation now? Because they had them back in the 1970s. You can only imagine a network that's available to them. Yeah, I think it's a very good point, Jason. Uh, and I think that that's the kind of outrider operation if Iran wants to flip that card and activate uh, the Hezbollah sleeper cell network that exists inside the United States. Uh, you know, it was a few months ago, we had uh, suspects rounded up in um, Michigan, if memory serves me right, on engagement and support for Hezbollah uh, for mapping uh, surveillance targets inside of New York City, which again, doesn't surprise me. And I think that's the one thing that most people don't understand when you're looking like an organization like Hezbollah that has been in the United States since uh, the 80s that they have off-the-shelf kind of plans and, and they update surveillance operations. So that also affords us, when I say us, the counterterrorism units, the NYPD, the LAPDs, to, to look for pre-operational attack kind of indications because they will follow the terrorist attack cycle. So there is a moment in time that they're vulnerable, but when it's too late is when they're driving that truck bomb towards a target. So the efforts have to be geared towards that proactive intelligence look for them ahead of time uh, and catching them in those pre-operational uh, windows of surveillance. And, but you have to know what to look for. And I think today we have gotten a lot better for that with technology and, and very robust uh, DHS efforts with fusion centers and the Joint Terrorism Task Forces and, and cities like New York in LA that do it better than anybody across the country when it comes to uh, just aggressive uh, intel collection and, and so forth. That intelligence gathering cycle for the sleeper cell, you know, it, it looks, so I'll, I'll give you guys, a, this is a story. I was in San Francisco, I used to live there, and I was driving across the Bay Bridge and there was a white van driving across the bridge in front of us. That happens a million times a day. But this van was taking, it was, it was nighttime, it was ta this van was taking pictures. Flash was going off. Every time they went by an upright of the, uh, of the lower deck of the bridge. So every vertical upright, not the horizontal ones, they were taking wow. a picture. And so I'm like, huh, um, that's weird. And I asked my buddy Jeff, I said, go around to the side. And if these guys in any way, and this, look, I want the audience to understand. This is what I do. Like, you know, all of us have this experience of gathering intel. So uh, there's specific reasons for this. If these guys look Arab in any way at all, I'm calling the CHP. I'm going to give them the license number. And then, you know, as a citizen, as you know, it's not my job to pull these guys over. Maybe they're just taking pictures for a school project. But if that van is up to no good and the CHP pulls them over, we've disrupted that cycle that Fred's talking about. And, you know, who knows who knows when or if ever the bridge will be attacked. But that's the kind of thing that we're looking for in terms of of disrupting that terrorism cycle. Yeah, you are spot on with that. And that was absolutely the right thing to do because of your observation skills and, and what you saw. And uh, that's just not normal behavior from the standpoint of of ninety nine point nine percent of people crossing that bridge on any given time especially in our post 9-11 environment. Right. You know, the challenge is uh, when you're looking at these kinds of pre-operational attack indicators, to me has always been those anomalies, meaning uh, you're not going to be able to rule out the tactical kind of threat. If you take a Sirhan Sirhan kind of model or a John Hinckley model where, you know, this is the Secret Service worst nightmare, that if you have that lone wolf, that lone assassin that's planning some sort of act, and he or she tells nobody yeah. what they're doing, and they've left no digital footprint. They haven't gone out and tried to buy a weapon and, and, and leave some sort of uh, trail behind them in some capacity. Those are the kinds of plots that at times become impossible to stop. And so what I think we have done as a nation and the counterterrorism community has done it is thwarting those strategic strikes on U.S. soil, mm. meaning, you know, stopping the next 9-11. And, and DHS has done a great job. And the TSA, for all the hassles and problems that we have on any given day traveling, at the end of the day, they have made this nation much safer because of their efforts. So there has been kind of this comprehensive effort with intelligence and physical security 
and surveillance technology and databases and cops today and citizens just knowing uh, what to look for. So I do think that it's been kind of a collective effort. And, and for the most part, we have done a great job in this country, I think, at, uh, at doing just that. Well, you know, that was a, a good point that you both brought up, especially, you know, I'd like to focus back on Pete for a second. Let's say you, you do see a van doing something like that. You write down a license plate, you provide that information to CHP. All of a sudden that van is showing up somewhere else on someone else's radar yep. because all of these Intel clearing houses out there all keep great databases. They have great Intel analysts and all these scraps of papers. So yes, I'm going to have to go with DHS on that. See something, say something too, because every little bit helps. Nobody knows where a phone number, a license plate, a suspicious person, identification or anything is going to fit into the big puzzle. Let's scope this thing back, Fred, because you've got decades of experience in this and one of the problems we have is that President Trump tends to create a lot of problems just by his mere presence. We'll, we'll, we'll set aside his his mouth and his tweets and his behaviors. And just if he shows up, someone's pissed off just by him being in the room or being on camera. How abnormal is this action of taking out Soleimani, especially given Iran's recent actions? They're most re- like the last 90 days, what they've done. Is this in any way bothersome or worrisome to you, taking all of the weird Trump stuff aside? Is this a presidential decision? Well, I think certainly the, uh, the, the president, in all probability, you know, made this decision after great lengthy discussions with, for example, Secretary of State Pompeo uh, and the National Security Advisor. I, I, I have no doubt that it was a, a collective effort and a and a list of options that was given to the president to, to make a decision predicated on what they perceived to be a uh, imminent threat or a threat that they could directly tie to the IRGC or the MOIS and some the Iranian intelligence service and military in some capacity. So uh, there's that. But you know, when it comes to these kinds of of incidents, I mean, uh, you know, the U.S. Secret Service. Um, you know, is all, already, the, you know, the kind of entity that is protecting, you know, the, the uh, highest profile protectee in the world. And, and so this is just, in many ways, another day in the office for them, you know, combined with, the, you know, your national assets to try, try to keep America alive. I mean, let's face it, you know, we have all been in this business a long time. There's no doubt that this incident has drastically increased the threat streams across the entire spectrum, right, and that becomes a bit of a challenge. But there's a tremendous amount of resources now devoted to triaging those threat streams. You know, the the, the intelligence community is is geared to that today, and I can speak firsthand to times in my life and career when it wasn't, and when it wasn't is when we had embassies lying in rubble, uh, or diplomats kidnapped and murdered. Uh, and that list is long. So, you know, today we are much better when it comes to intelligence collection, analysis, and dissemination than we've ever been in the history of America. Yeah. And as we've learned these lessons, and look, we'll just say this, the intelligence com- uh, community is not perfect. We have our mistakes. We sort of wax and wane with our capability, depending on a lot of factors, one of them being political. But when we do take big hits like Lebanon, like the, the Twin Towers going down, we do adjust and we make it harder and we do harden ourselves up as a target, which ultimately gives us a wider variety of targets in more places. But we do get better at understanding what it takes to interrupt these cycles and we do get better at that. And it really, a single president is a figure in time. And, and, and time will tell if this is a good decision. Lord knows we can't tell today. You know, <laughs> this is no way to know. It appears well, on the surface to be a reasonable action. And certainly within the president's purview to do it. We are better at this. It does seem like there are fewer Carlos the Jackals running around terrorizing the entire world. Is that because a lot of these kind of threats have gone cyber? Is that, is that, the, is that what we're looking at, Fred? Well, I think that is uh, the fifth domain when you start looking at, uh, you know, uh, nation state actions, meaning uh, I, I think when everybody thinks of blowback with Iran, 
for example, the immediate default from my generation, uh, having grown up in the 60s and the 70s, is some sort of kinetic action, meaning tanks against tanks, uh, soldiers against soldiers. But uh, in reality, what we could be seeing at is nothing more than the Iranian Revolutionary Guard sitting behind their laptops in Tehran, deciding which systems of the United States to meddle with or to try to take down. So to me, to me, the interesting aspect, and we really have never crossed into that yet, and we talk a lot about that here at Stratfor and, and have written a fair amount on the topic is, you know, when does that translate into some sort of kinetic response? Meaning, what is the threshold, Pete and Jason, for a cyber action directed against America by a nation state like Iran to cause the United States to strike back, not in a cyber component, but in a kinetic kind of action. What do you guys think? I'll take that one. Yeah, I think it's going to have to be something that's going to cause damage, either financially or physically. Either they're going to hit a power plant, shut it down. It causes chaos. Because imagine any specific part of the country without power or without anything for two days that's all it takes is 48 hours before people start going uh a little nuts and then the other thing is what if they hit us in the, the financial infrastructure and take us offline the dow crashes and then we have another 2008 but it has to be something significant and that's one thing i wanted to bring up about you know us striking first essentially with a main uh, taking out a main target now iran has to save face so if they did do some sort of cyber attack, it has to be something extreme. That's that's my opinion. What do you think, Pete? Well, I, I am not as uh, I'm not as confident that Iran has the capability and desire to do this. I think that the ante being up the way it was has forced them to go back and, and reassert. Because if we were going to go tit for tat, we got a whole lot more tits. You know, <laughs> and it can get really ugly for them. We've already destroyed one of their centrifuges with with a cyber attack. So they already know what that feels like. And the folks in charge in Iran are a lot closer to being toppled than we are in, in America. So I, I would say that they would. My guess is that they will stay small, do what they do well and go and attack things in Africa, go target a consulate. And I think there will be some of those physical things, but I think that they just do what they've been doing. It, for the most part, has been working, you know, like, fucking with the Americans in the Persian Gulf, you know, and, and sending boats over, just doing that. And then there's, fellas, there's a real possibility that one of our Navy ships will shoot down an airliner full of 300 Iranians and make the situation worse for ourselves because, well, we've done that before. Well, the other argument to be made, uh, in, and I, uh, I, I don't want to come across as an, uh, an Iranian sympathizer by any stretch of the imagination, right. uh, but I could argue based upon some of the reporting that's, that's come in since the, the killing of General Soleimani is that the United States looks like the irrational actor here, and Iran is now a victim of big bad America uh, just using its heavy ability to, to reach out and touch whoever we want. So, you know, there's there's a there's a degree of international support now uh, for Iran uh, as to the United States actions, and so when you calculate that regarding Iran's next step. Uh, I would agree with you, Pete, that in, in many ways, uh, the, the asymmetric kind of approach of just the guerrilla warfare using proxies to, to endlessly harass us uh, is one that's very sound. Having said all that, though, I, I think, and we were discussing that this morning at length here uh, in our Iran meeting, let's face it, we have killed uh, their version of General MacArthur or General Eisenhower. Yeah. And therefore... Uh, it, there, there is a degree of expectation on the part of the Iranian public that there has to be a pound of flesh extracted as a result of this. And if so, what is that pound of flesh and what is a, a, a similar target? And just due to our footprint, our U.S. military footprint uh, in, the, in the Persian Gulf, in the Middle East, 
you know, there's a lot of targets to pick from. Even here at home, you know, uh, hopefully our generals have a great personal security detachment that's covering our six right now. Yeah. the I mean, obviously, there's an elevated threat. and We're going to be listening and paying attention and putting our assets on trying to determine what is next. And I think there's also something to be said for Iran's got a lot more rope now that we've killed their top general. So they can go out and they can do their pinprick attacks everywhere because we can't just continue to, to kill the top general over and over again because the world will get upset with us because we are punching down in this case. What about, look, so, and I don't know if you guys know this, but I spent a lot of time in Baghdad district after one, actually two of the elections. And I got to talk to and get to know quite a few Iraqis and um, religious sect aside, these folks by and large hate Iranian involvement in their government. Now that doesn't mean that they're, they want Americans involved in their government either, but given the choice between America or Iran, and this is a while back, they absolutely despised having Iran be so entwined with their government. So have we now, obviously, we got to get done with the flag waving and the car burning and all that stuff. But have we done ourselves any favor by by deflating the Iranian balloon for Iraq at all? I think that's a very good question. I, I look at uh, I think if we uh, walk back the cat and look at the preceding incidents leading to General Soleimani's demise, let's not forget the the huge uh, facility seizure at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad uh, and the death of the American that, that obviously precipitated this, and then this uh, threat information that's out there. So uh, I think that if I'm looking at it from just a, a, a threat assessment, physical security kind of perspective there, uh, the one little thing that frightens me, Pete, with that is the inability at that time for the Iraqi government, for whatever reason, political reasons, whatever, uh, we're, we're not able to protect our, at least our, our outer perimeter at the U.S. Embassy there. And then you start thinking about your outlining uh, consulates and, and, of course, everybody then harkens back to the special mission compound Benghazi and these outposts scattered around you know, the, the Middle East and, and, I, and Iraq specifically. So will the host government uh, continue to support uh, the uh, protection of U.S. Uh, assets uh, and, and diplomats? Uh, time will tell. And you can even look at this as, uh, is this 4D chess? You know, us killing him, Iraq saying you must leave, gets us pulled out of Iraq uh, honorably, if you look at it that way. I might be looking into it a little bit too deeply and maybe holistic, but is this an honorable exit? You know, we take out one of their main targets, we get exiled from Iraq, and we leave. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here, and if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. You know, we take out one of their main targets, we get exiled from Iraq, and we leave. Well, but keep in mind, uh, when that vote happened, they barely had a quorum. It was yep. a Shia-specific quorum. The Kurds and the Sunnis all rejected it. And I promise you, in that room, in that parliament, Shias had to march in step, but there's a whole lot of Shias that are like, fuck that general, you know, because their families have suffered. You know, that, that, there's not a lot of love lost towards Iran. In I, I would bet that there's a lot more support for us staying, obviously in a limited and controlled capacity, but... We're going to teach them how to be a better army. Iran is going to exploit them uh, for their own gain, and and they're tired of being in the middle of that. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you, Pete. Uh, I think that uh, you know the next uh, thirty days unfolding in Iraq will be fascinating to see what what comes of this. Uh, you know, we certainly have create we certainly have drastically increased our our tactical footprint by de- pre deploying assets and boxing in on the margins in and around there, you know, but I think a lot of that is a lot of the hard lessons that we learned in Benghazi with uh, inadequate contingency planning and the inability to extract, which uh, as as we all know uh, is critical when you're looking at, you know, how are you going to get your people out? 
when they come in over the walls. And, and so these are the kinds of things that I think are, are, are just really going to be fascinating, you know, to try to see unfold over the next few days. So let's talk a little bit about your books. We've done a lot of the current event thing, and, and I don't want us bound by, by that. I mean, look, that's a great laydown. Then it isn't hyperbolic. We're not focused on how crazy President Trump is. And we're giving folks an understanding of that. You know, actually, let's do spend another minute there. Let's talk about the people who are in the room, all of the rooms that are south of the president's echelon. You know, the the quality of people, the expertise that goes into, I mean, how many people have PhDs in Persian, Iranian, Oriental studies that are involved in this day-to-day operation? You know, let, let's talk a little bit about the qualities of the experts and, and also the sheer number of people compared to what our, Iran or any other country can throw at this. Fred, can you give us some idea of, of what the intellectual horsepower is behind this problem? Yeah, I certainly can try. Uh, To me, and I spent a fair amount of time uh, dealing with the National Security Council on my watch, for example, on on certain counterterrorism issues or ongoing counterterrorism issues. And, you know, the one thing that was always amazing to me is that although I may not have been the smartest person in the room, uh, you always had people that were a heck of a lot smarter on whatever subject matter issue that it was. And uh, I don't care what the issue was uh, between the, the DOD and the CIA uh, or the State Department. There was always somebody that uh, was that subject matter expert. So when you start thinking through these kinds of problem sets, let's face it, for years there's been contingency plans in place to take some sort of kinetic action on Iran, and and these were some of the options. And... You know, those position papers are written by very smart people and good and bad when it comes to the ramifications. And and I think that, you know, although these decisions can be made in a vacuum at the end of the day between the secretary of state, the national security advisor and the president, uh, you know, it's it's predicated at times upon some pretty good intelligence analysis that's leading up to certain decisions. And and I think that, you know, those can be obviously discarded or, or, or not accepted or, or chosen not to be listened to at times. But, you know, again, as a product of that system, I think we have some, you know, some of the most talented people in the world working in the intelligence community uh, in any given administration, you know, regardless of what you read in the, in the, in the newspaper at times, uh, you know, this is where the best and the brightest are still drawn to, uh, they love working and that they're patriots serving. And, you know, the government functions uh, w- with or without politics at times, meaning, you know, I, I've, I've, I've said this before and I'll say it again. You know, I work for uh, a, a lot of different administrations, both Republican and Democratic. And, you know, at the end of the day, I've seen bad decisions made by both at times. And, but I've seen the people working behind the scenes are doing their job, and I have full trust and confidence in them. Well, that's an excellent point, Fred. There will always be ground truth. There will always be the GS-12, 13, GS-14s uh, below that are actually there, out there doing the job, Foreign Service, FP, whatever their class is. There's real ground truth out there, and there's really hard workers doing the right thing regardless of party. That's an excellent point, and thanks for bringing that up. But one thing I want to transition into is your books. You know, I, I'm i now a, a big fan. You sent me some signed copies of uh, – I read your first uh, – one of your first forays, Ghosts, years ago. I just finished Chasing Shadows, and now I'm on Beirut Rules. And for anybody, you know, I got to give a quick backstory. In, in, in the 80s, I was a huge fan of counterterrorism books. I would eat up anything I possibly could at the library. There just wasn't a lot of information out there. Now, since then, there's been a lot of like social media posts, a lot of just really quick snapshots on what terrorism world is really like. But if you really dig into your books, there is a wealth of knowledge about terror networks and how they really work. And for anybody out there right now that wants to know the current deal about real terror, check out Fred's books, especially Beirut Rules. You want to tell us a little bit about your books? Well, well, first, Jason, I uh, thank you very much for those very kind words. I, uh, 
I, I've said this a zillion times, I'm, I'm not a good author, I'm just blessed to have been published. And uh, I, I think there's a big difference. And I'm a little bit like Forrest Gump when you look back in my life that I was either in the wrong place at the wrong time or, or however you want to look at it. But my first book, uh, Ghost, uh, Confessions of a Counterterrorism Agent, uh, was published by Random House in 2008, which seems like a lifetime ago now. Uh, and then that just chronicles my time as uh, coming as a police officer and moving into the counterterrorism division of the State Department, which at one point we had three of us for the world, and I was the, the, the youngest of the three, so I was given the Middle East by my old crusty boss, uh, Steve Gleason, who I'm still in contact with. And, and he taught me a few things. He said, you know, on, on day one on the job, he, he tossed me the Beirut embassy bombings and say, said, don't go home until you read these. And then, you know, the hard lessons of if you want to understand Hezbollah, you need to study the Black September organization. And that they were the organization that carried out the Munich massacre in 1972. So my second book is about the Black September organization, and it's called Chasing Shadows. And it's the story of uh, the murder of uh, Colonel Joseph Alon, who was a hero of the Israeli Air Force, uh, who was gunned down in my neighborhood when I was a kid. You know, I, 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 I probably, if you had a shrink study me, would probably say that that kind of set me on my path because I was always intrigued as to what happened to him. And, and that led me to join the rescue squad and that led me to become a cop. And, and then that led me to, to become an agent and where I reopened the case into his murder and nobody wanted to reopen the case. And my old boss said, why are you spending time on this old cold case? And I just couldn't let it go. But, you know, that's, that's kind of me. And then my third book was written with uh, Sam Katz, who's an old friend of mine. And there's, there's a backstory to Sam. Sam had written a book years ago when I was still an agent called Relentless Pursuit. And that was the story on the hunt for Ramsey Yosef, the mastermind of the first World Trade Center bombing. And I was in Sam's book, and, and I've gotten much more credit for his capture than I deserve. That was a, a remarkable team effort. And so Sam wrote about that and me in those days. And so it just, uh, it just by chance, we were discussing after Benghazi. He called me, or, and I said, hey, I'm thinking about a book on Benghazi. And he said, well, so am I. So we said, well, let's collaborate. Let's knock this out quickly. And St. Martin's Press printed that. And uh, that book is called Under Fire. And that book has also been optioned to HBO Films. They have that story. Based upon that book, we worked so well together, we decided to, co to collaborate on our next book together, which was called Beirut Rules, which is the current book out. And it's a story of the only CIA station chief to ever be kidnapped and murdered by Hezbollah. Hezbollah, of course, is an Iranian proxy. In, in my mind, anybody that wants to understand what we could see coming down the path from Iran, uh, I think we discuss in great detail the history of the kinds of attacks that uh, Iran has perpetrated against the United States and the West. So those are my uh, four books. Wow. That, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's amazing. You know, your career, books, and you're still on uh, the Stratfor, stratosphere, I should say. <laughs> the Stratfor stratosphere. I like that. Yeah, I like but, that. Uh, too. I'll have you're, to uh, tell our but, social media folks. That's a great uh, tweet. Yeah, just, uh, you just put that by Dr. Jason Piccolo. On it. I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in terms of the books, people can buy them on Amazon, I'm assuming, is the best place for them? Uh, any of the uh, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, I have, you can go to the uh, stratford.com website and find them or my website, which is officialfredburton.com. Uh, and all of the books are listed there as well. And then you said you're working on a new book. Can you discuss it yet? Or are we still kind of having to wait on that? Yeah, we have to wait on that one because uh, there's some uh, sensitivities involved right now regarding the topic. So I'm, I'm not at liberty to really go into it, Pete, that it's very kind of you to bring that up. Stay tuned. It should 
there should be some information surrounding that pretty soon. Well, as soon as you have that, I know people would love to hear from you. Let's talk a little bit about how you do your job, at least when you were being actively being a counter terrorism agent, because it's, it's, uh, it's just such an unknown thing. Like, you know, in the movies, we're all blended into one superhero person. We're an actor, action guy, we're a collector, we're an analyst, you know? So what does, no shit, what does Fred do in a day back in that time when you were actively chasing Carlos the Jackal or whoever it was? Well, uh, it's, you know, when I, when I do talks for law enforcement, Pete, uh, I, I invariably get cops or agents come up to me afterwards and say, I really want to do what you did. And I say, you really can't right. because in, in the, in the eighties, remember this is your pre nine 11 environment. I mean, we don't have cell phones. Uh, we don't have the internet. We are still dealing with uh, IBM selectric typewriters <laughs> and our, and our database was three by five index cards. So uh, I remember going through the Beirut embassy bombing, the 83 bombing, and literally writing names of potential suspects on three by five cards and, and had them lined up on my desk. Uh, and that was my filing system. And we were dealing with a, a lot of paper because we didn't have computers. And, and then the first computer we got, uh, nobody really knew how to work it. Hmm. And having not grown up in a computer environment, as, as, as some of your listeners may understand, you guys are much too young. You know, we were dealing with the days of, of spreadsheets and three by five index cards. And, and so we were just reacting. I, I vividly recall a case involving a hijacking once that was ongoing. And we had them throughout the entire 80s. And I remember reading a flash message from our command center, which was called Foghorn at the time. And I had just gotten down to read a paper flash and plane had been hijacked, I think, out of Pakistan. And my boss, who's smoking in the office, is looking at me and saying, Fred, what are you doing about this? And I'm looking at him like, I had no idea what the hell to do about this. <laughs> and, you know, that was just the kind of world we were living in. And, and so, you know, we would always deploy and respond, you know, usually within 24 hours of an incident occurring and just go out and, and do basic law enforcement investigative work. I mean... For example, I can remember in 86 deploying out on countless cases, but uh, we had a rocket attack at the U.S. Embassy in Madrid by the Japanese Red Army. And I went over, met with the Spanish National Police, took pictures of, of the rocket launcher, took pictures of what it, where it happened, um, and, and tried to piece together who might have been responsible for it. It was just basic law enforcement work just done in an international arena. And... You know, probably one of the most complex cases that I was sent out on, uh, Pete and Jason, was uh, the August 1988 plane crash, which killed President Zia of Pakistan, our United States ambassador, uh, General Brigadier, uh, Brigadier General uh, Wassam from the U.S. Army, and the entire Pakistani chief of staff. And I'm probably 28, 29 years old, and the agent that was sent with me was out of my special agent class because the State Department had hired so many of us right after the embassy bombings that uh, we, were, we were the team that went out to investigate this plane crash. And, and literally neither one of us had ever investigated a plane crash, much less one that killed the uh, head of state. Yeah. And, and, and I can remember just getting there within 24 hours of the, of the plane crash in Bawala Lapore, Pakistan, Look, and it looked a lot like West Texas, you know, just like sagebrush blowing around and dust devils swirling and, and looking at the smoking hole in the ground and literally having no idea what to do. And we've all been there, whether yeah. we want to admit it or not. We, we've all been in those situations where you're just overwhelmed. And, and I can vividly recall thinking, Fred, what in the hell are you doing here? Why didn't you stay in your police car where life was simple? And, and, and I kind of missed those days then. And I kind of regretted leaving because I was just overwhelmed with the scope of these incidents. And we were literally flying by the seat of the pants, our pants, but it's no longer like that. You know, that, that same plane crash today, guys, you know, we would have 
oh my God, we would have an FBI evidence response team. We would have NTSB. You know, we would have uh, all kinds of forward deployment, DOD assets. It, it's just, it was just a different era. So and, you're saying uh, that President Trump is a terrible person. No, I'm not, by any stretch of the imagination, I'm not saying that. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, I know. I'm just, uh, I'm making a joke because we often lose sight of how much expertise, you know, all of these different multi, multi-departmental teams. Like you said, NT, you, everybody has to wear a windbreaker so everybody can know who everybody is because there's so many different people there. This is not a singular person who's just saying, do this, do that. No, no, no. Like the Border Patrol is probably there because it's within five miles of the border and Jason's guys are there. There's just so many people involved in these things trying to collaborate, figure out what happened, and then figure out if, if, if any justice can be extracted or if an error can be corrected for everybody else and save lives. It's, I, I get tired of the whole dismissing everything, you know, dismissing all of the expertise. And that's... I love that you gave us this uh, snapshot of how it was to be you and then where we are now. It's, it's just remarkable. Yeah, I think the, it, it's, um, it's a totally different ball game. And, and certainly, you know, the, the one hard lesson that I've learned and over, over the course of my career in the counterterrorism arena is that unfortunately it still takes tragedy to force change. Right. Meaning, you can look at these inflection points in the course of our counterterrorism history, and you can go back to the 70s with some of our assassinations of our ambassadors in, in Afghanistan and in Beirut, for example, and that resulted in a hiring of a few more agents. Then you look at the horrific embassy bombings in Beirut, which resulted in the creation of this unit to protect diplomatic personnel around the world. Thank goodness it gave me a job. Uh, then you look at uh, the first World Trade Center attack, which was the first big strategic strike on U.S. soil, and that kind of changed the game. But then it took 9-11 to really recreate the intelligence community and create the TSA, good, bad, or indifferent, and reshuffle agencies, you know, and putting the U.S. Secret Service under DHS, which still makes no sense to me, Jason, as to why that took place. You and me both. Uh, so... Uh, and then, it, of course, you, you still get tragedies uh, such as Benghazi. And um, but then as a result of that, the State Department creates a new training center and, and agents are taught to protect people when a building's set on fire. I mean, I was never trained to protect anybody when a building set on fire. And so uh, it just takes tragedy to force change. And that's that's. Uh, the history of the counterterrorism community, at least that I've lived through. Yeah. Well, shit, man, that's, that's a fantastic lay down of all of it from, you know, the current state of affairs, how you used to do your job and, and your books. I, I, you know, I'll, I'll let you do this. Why don't you, uh, why don't you give Jason or I a question or two and, and we'll, we'll let that be the thing. You, you ask us a question and we'll uh, throw an answer back at you and we'll call it a show. All right, I'll throw one out at Jason. Jason, uh, based on your experience in dealing with uh, homeland security issues, what keeps you up at night now in light of the killing of General Soleimani? The southwest border, and then also what we already have in the country already. Now, I wrote a position, uh, they call it an executive summary, about Syrians that were coming through the Southwest border back when I used to work at the uh, White House Security Council thing. And uh, I was really concerned because we don't, we don't have a huge vetting apparatus at the Southwest border. I, we don't have a really good clearinghouse. I mean, yes, agencies are working together. Uh, yes, we're taking a basic snapshot and doing a, a quick 10 question interview with the people from special interest countries coming through the Southwest border. But we're not doing a really deep dive because there's just simply too many of them coming across. And I'm not talking about like, you know, Central and South America. I'm talking about everything else that transits. So those people will get interviewed. They'll get uh, let loose into the country and we just have no idea where they are. So, yeah, that kind of keeps me up at night. And uh, I just think we could do more. Yeah, that's fascinating. And that's also pretty frightening when you think about that uh, just from a strategic perspective. Pete, uh, when you look at uh, the importance of 
social media or podcasts, for example, today, and just looking at it from an awareness perspective for the intelligence community. I, I, anytime we do these, I get countless notes and emails and, and direct messages from, from colleagues or, or folks who are in the business. And uh, how do you think this form or this medium has changed the intelligence community? I think it's created hubs of knowledge where we can take very specific experience that's useful to the young guy, like, how the hell do I do this? Well, you you should be listening to, for example, the Break It Down show. I mean, you look at how many shows that we've done that are spy versus spy. You know, obviously, we're not combative, but we're talking about real things that we've all had to do to go out and counteract an enemy or interact with an enemy. These are things that you know, it's one thing to run an administration better and better all the time, but if the people from the field aren't like, I could go right now to the army and talk about my ability to collect intelligence and nobody would give two fucks. I wouldn't get invited to speak because my network were a bunch of warlords and criminals, you know? So I, I'm relatively unknown, even in my own field, even though in the army, in terms of collection, there's nobody who's better at collecting. I got to stay in the field over and over and over again so that I got better and better and better at it, but I have no audience. So I think the podcast, especially mine, it enables people to get real practical lessons because telling us big strategic things that don't have any rooting and ground truth, that means nothing. You have to link the ground truth reality to the strategic outcome. Otherwise, you're going nowhere. And I think podcasts are a, an opportunity to do something like that. I could not agree with you more. That was spot on. Well, fellas, that's about an hour. I really appreciate it. Fred, anytime you want to come on and talk or if you find a guest that you want to bring on, I would love to have you in because these conversations, they really do enlighten people and not just uh, our fellow collectors and, and uh, federal type folks, but just in general, people want to know these kind of stories because it's important to you know that those kind of experts are out there and that that they have stuff that's going to blow your mind with how simple and practical and, you know, we have control of a lot of these problems. It's the small stuff that gets by us, and it gets by everybody. Well, thank you very much, Pete. You're very kind. And Jason, uh, I can't thank you enough for your support. And, and yeah, your- anytime. <laughs>